It's 2016 and all over France, European teams are battling for the title best in Europe. Exactly 100 years ago, there was a different kind of war and winning came at a different kind of price. June 1916. Sounds of digging fill the French countryside around the River Somme as British and French soldiers dig trenches in preparation to resist the advancing German army. It was a period of summer hayfields, singing birds and flowers on the one hand, and mud, blood and the stink of bodies on the other, with nothing to separate these two worlds but a few hours of marching time. Digging trenches is hard work, but there are 100,000 soldiers here. In just a few weeks, trenches zigzag through the French countryside. Since the war started in 1914, there have been major battles in Mons, Ypres and Luce. But this is the big one. This will be the battle to end all battles. There was no time to pay attention to the summer solstice on the front. Conditions were unthinkable, horrid, foul. <gasps> were they feeding the rats or were the rats feeding on them? Meanwhile on the home front, the threat was very real. Bombing raids by Zeppelins marked the first time that civilians themselves were targeted in war. The First World War brought immense social changes, particularly to working class women, who enjoyed new freedoms working in munitions factories. Never before had women played such a vital role in society. So important, in fact, were these factories that King George V often toured round throughout the country, including new builds such as Gretna in Scotland. The King observed rows and rows of women efficiently working together creating shells and other munitions ready to be sent to the front. Their working conditions were safe, and women even had the opportunity to follow fashions such as new silk blouses. Assembly lines demonstrated to the king the munitions factories were well organised and overall, the women enjoyed their work. The reality, however, could not have been more different. Through constant contact with cordite, the women soon came to be known as canaries, due to the yellowing of their skin. In addition to working closely with toxic radioactive materials, the constant handling of gun cotton, also known as devil's porridge, was a highly flammable material found in bombs, which meant that explosions were frequent and casualties high. One such casualty was Ada Curtis. Found facing downwards, her scalp had been torn off of her skull, which itself had been completely destroyed. Her brain suffered further destruction, with parts of it being found three feet away from the body. The destruction of the spinal cord meant that death was instantaneous. However, we must be careful not to overlook the significance and impact of women being drafted into factories. They experienced new liberties and freedoms, despite their pay being less than that of men. They gained new skills, with some factories even offering free training and experience, 
a stark contrast to their former roles as homemakers. One could also argue that the new skills and experience played a part in the passing of the 1918 Representation of the People Act, whereby women were granted the vote. Near the village of Thiepval, the men of the 36th Ulster Division prepare for battle. Under the cover of darkness, they move through the forward trenches. The men, obscured by the bombardment, crept into and formed up in no man's land and moved to within 140 metres of the German trenches. At 7.30, the British guns went silent. Out of the mud, the Ulstermen rise and they charge at the enemy. With few casualties, the first enemy trenches are taken. Fighting continued throughout the day. The Leeds rifles had been put at the disposal of the 36th Ulster Division, and by 9 p.m. they had reached the Ulstermen. But it was too late, and the Ulstermen were forced to retreat at 10.30 p.m. However, a party of 30 men from the 17th Leeds rifles were left behind. Corporal George Sanders takes control. Organising the defences, he prepares to hold the ground at all costs. Fending off multiple German attacks, Sanders and his men end up holding the position for 36 hours without food or water before being relieved. For his actions, George Sanders was awarded the Victoria Cross. All along the 24 kilometre front, the huge offensive cost the British alone nearly 58,000 casualties, of whom nearly 20,000 were killed. This was only the start. The Battle of the Somme would go on through July and August, then September, and the final day wouldn't be until the 18th of November. When I first became a nurse, I was young and believed that things could always be fixed. But the pain and suffering, I quickly realised, did not end on the battlefield, and at night, when all was quiet, there was nothing but scratching bedsheets to soothe the soldiers' thoughts. My first patient, James, had been exposed to noxious gases and lost his vision entirely, as well as being shot in his left leg and was facing amputation. Keeping up his spirits was difficult most days. So as men streamed in from the darkness, we tried to ignore the lice infections, the seeping wombs and missing limbs saturated with gangrene. We tried to look through the blood and tune out the bone-chilling whales crying for home. We just tried to make the world turn for the wounded again. Yet, all James wanted was to see the sunshine. And as I finally understood, the Somme left almost all of them in darkness forever. Historian John Terrain wrote that artillery was the winner of the First World War. It caused the greatest loss of life and most dreadful wounds and deepest fear. Mechanised warfare, including tanks and drones, have become central to modern warfare, such as in the ongoing war in Congo. Film and photography have been used to document war and spread propaganda, from the Battle of the Somme to the conflicts in Vietnam to the current wars on drugs and terror. In the case of the Somme, soldiers came from across the Commonwealth countries. They came, they fought and contributed, a Canadian piper, James Richardson, piped as his unit walked towards the German lines. When he went back to get his pipes, he was never seen again. John Leake, an Australian with others, took a German strongpoint. Leake was always the last man to withdraw and his moral support encouraged his comrades. He was awarded the VC. William Frederick Folds, a South African, saved two men by carrying them wounded from no man's land, awarded the VC. A New Zealander, Donald Brown, got the VC for capturing machine gun posts, awarded the VC posthumously. The British West Indies Regiment served as labour units, making gun emplacements near the front line. The 20th Deacon Horse, made up of Indian cavalrymen, also served at the Somme. Most of them didn't return home. 
This is what made it a world war. People from all over the world were thinking, worrying and waiting for news about their loved ones. Britain wasn't the only country with a home front. One hundred years on, the land around the Somme is still scarred by the battle. Many, many soldiers suffered what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder, but was then called shell shock. And ghosts of the conflict have haunted our time since. Missing brothers, fathers, sons or lovers. What do you think about the First World War?